Hey everybody, this is the second in a four video series presenting The Sign for the Bride, Part 1. This is part of the larger study titled When Cometh That Thief in the Night on TheOpenScroll.com. Find links to this featured web page below in the comments or on the Open Scroll blog. This installment features the sections titled A Sign of Apostasy is Not a Sign. A Greek word study exposes the gross violation of fundamental principles, addenda on the sign, and who is the restrainer. A sign of apostasy is not a sign. Let's consider two popular versions of verse 3. And this is 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, first with the King James Version. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And now in the New American Standard Bible. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Paul is telling us about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. It's very important that we know this will not happen until after something else is witnessed. Very simply, Paul refers to what will be recognized as a sign. In the language of the King James Version, there will come a falling away, apostasia, first. According to the New American Standard Bible, we're given a more interpreted rendering, unless the apostasy, apostasia, comes first. When we see that the English word apostasy has been translated directly from the Greek word apostasia, it's only natural for English readers to assume that it must surely be a dependable translation. The etymology would seem to be the absolute proof of it. Lending this further credence, the interpretation of the Greek word apostasia as apostasy is typically explained by scholars in a way that seems to make sense. I'm challenging that assumption because the interpretation isn't supported by the context, and neither does it make any sense whatsoever when you have a better grasp of the context. The scholarship behind the traditional argument fails to respect the context on two different levels. It fails on the fundamental principles of biblical interpretation, and it fails when the symmetrical thematic structure is taken into consideration. Let's begin our deeper inquiry in the light of what we've learned so far in this study. If we translate the Greek word apostasia in a strictly literal sense, it means standing away from. The word simply describes a positional relationship. What is it that could come to be standing away from what, which results in the revealing of the man of lawlessness? Remember, Verses 6 and 7 are thematically linked in the most direct way to 3a. The key insight is that a baptism is unfolding, and what is being described in the esoteric text is the orchestrated interplay between the realms of spirit and flesh. See it? The anointing of unholy spirit comes to be standing away from the agent or agencies that had been charged with his restraint in his former heavenly abode. If we consider a more literal rendering of verse 3, like what's offered in the Greek interlinear, below, and substitute the more literal translation of apostasia, it reads very correctly, just as it is written. And this is 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 from the Greek-English interlinear. Not until shall have come, elthe, the standing away from, apostasia, first, and shall have been revealed, Apocalypse, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction. When I began to grasp the simplicity of the message, the Lord helped me climb out of a deep doctrinal rut. A simple analogy occurred to me. If I told you that there was an accident and a car was wrecked, what would be your first impression? Would you think that an accident happened and then, some time later, a car was wrecked? Not likely. You'd naturally infer the connection that the car was involved in and wrecked in the accident. The lawless one is revealed because of what happens when the spirit of Antichrist leaves heaven and descends upon him. Reread the more literally rendered version of verse 3 above. 
While the language may seem a little awkward in our common tongue, when our concern is with accuracy, it's a better and more comprehensible interpretation. With regard to this difficult text, I had been groping around in the murky darkness all those many years ago. The mistaken notion that the apostasy of the church was going to happen, and then the rapture, and then at some time after that, the lawless one would be revealed. This was a major impediment. After the Lord stuck me in a shortening loop cycle and subsequently led me into that brighter light, it occurred to me that there are no references to the state of the church or to some shift in its status to be found anywhere in the context. No revolt, rebellion, or apostasy. The fresh insight revealed a conflict with my former dogma of the pre-trib rapture. I had been deceived. The so-called sign of religious apostasy is no sign at all. The notion that the church was the restrainer through its operation of the Holy Spirit and that it would have to be removed via the rapture before the lawless one could or would be revealed was entirely false. While I hadn't yet resolved some of the other erroneous doctrinal assertions of the pre-trib rapture hypothesis, the revelation insight that came forth enabled me to break through the impasse and continue the progression of studies at the Lord's feet. What a welcome breakthrough that was. A Greek word study exposes the gross violation of fundamental principles. As I claimed previously, the scholarship behind the traditional argument for apostasy fails to respect the context of 2 Thessalonians 2.3 on two different levels. Having already seen how the meaning of this misinterpreted word is elucidated in the bright light of the symmetrical thematic structure, we're going to do a Greek word study that validates it. This study reveals a gross violation of the fundamental principles of biblical interpretation, which is known as hermeneutics. Many years ago, I was rigorously taught the rules for biblical interpretation from a man who learned them in seminary. Those were closely aligned with the principles found in E.W. Bollinger's classic How to Enjoy the Bible, or The Word and the Words, How to Study Them. One of the rules is to interpret a word in light of where it's been used before, with special emphasis being given to the first occurrence. This is Bollinger's Canon 5. Note well this definition of the word context. The part of a text or statement that surrounds a particular word or passage and determines its meaning. That's from the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language. Common sense informs us that we can't take the meaning derived from one context and import it into another without carefully discerning the details of any differences and assigning them the due level of respect. If we violate the guiding principles of context, what results is the pollution and corruption of the interpretation. Yet, as I'm about to show you, this is what the exalted scholars have done in the case of the very important word, apostasia. The exact form of the word used in 2 Thessalonians 2.3, apostasia, occurs only once in the Bible. However, three more forms of the word occur in four other places. These forms have a shared meaning. Since the word form in 2 Thessalonians has the feminine gender of the Greek language in common with the word form in Acts, we'll begin there. According to the 21st chapter of Acts, the Apostle Paul was led on a drama-filled journey to Jerusalem. Upon his arrival, he came before the Apostle James and the elders. The council had not yet come to grips with what freedom in Christ really meant, and they were consequently misjudging Paul. Read Galatians for more insight into the subject. Acts 21, 21 And they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake, apostasian, Moses, 
telling them not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. To forsake Moses is a rather loose interpretation, one that's featured in several English versions. Several other versions offer these variants, to abandon Moses, to turn away from Moses, to depart from Moses, to separate from Moses, to turn their backs on the laws of Moses, to forsake the law of Moses. To be strictly literal about the interpretation, James accused Paul of teaching those Jews among the Gentiles that they should be standing away from Moses. The sense of Paul's teaching was that they should separate themselves from or distance themselves from the practices of the Mosaic tradition that had been their cultural heritage. Let's consult with some recognized authorities to learn how the sense of religious defection and apostasy has been introduced. The Greek word apostasia is G646 in Strong's Concordance. According to that scholarly authority, it means forsake, an apostasy, defection, revolt. Always in New Testament of religious defection is translated to forsake in Acts 2121. Literally, thou teachest apostasy from Moses. In 2 Thessalonians 2.3, falling away. According to Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, apostasia means a defection, revolt, apostasy, and fall, fallen, falling, fell, and is used in the New Testament of religious apostasy. In Acts 21.21, it is translated to forsake. Literally, thou teachest apostasy from Moses. In 2 Thessalonians 2.3, the falling away signifies apostasy from the faith. In papyri documents, it is used politically of rebels. Scholars may well agree, but consensus alone does not validate their conclusions. I'm not disputing that the word might be used politically of rebels in papyri documents. I am arguing that the import of meaning from papyri documents into Acts 21.21 is unwarranted. The word apostasia appears in the Septuagint four times. Joshua 22.22, Second Chronicles 29.19, again in 33.19, and Jeremiah 2.19. Again, any import of meaning from one context into another must give due respect to any differences in those local contexts. As already demonstrated, the plain and simple meaning of apostasia is entirely sufficient to provide an accurate understanding of Acts 21.21. 21. The feminine gender form appears in 2 Thessalonians and Acts. The neuter gender form appears in the Gospels, where all three occurrences involve divorce, even, very specifically, a certificate of divorce. The legal dissolution of a marriage involves a husband and wife, a man and woman who had been formally joined together, but who are then formally recognized as being separate. This involves a positional change in their relationship, where they effectively come to be standing away from one another. Even today, in the English language, the word divorce has this meaning. A separation between things that were once connected or associated. The very concise translation of the neuter gender word forms as divorce informs us about the sibling word used in 2 Thessalonians 2. It should by now be patently obvious that the interpretation of apostasia as apostasy in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 is a grievous error. There are no references made in the context to the corporate body of Christ or to some shift in its status. No revolt, rebellion, or apostasy. The respected scholars have failed to discern and respect the context, violating fundamental principles of hermeneutics the widely recognized authorities have also failed to account for the symmetrical thematic structure, where verse 3a is paired with 6 and 7. There is perhaps no justification for the kind of sloppy and frankly irresponsible scholarship we've exposed herein. Yet, because the author watches very carefully over his word, I believe that he has allowed this gross misinterpretation because it serves his great purposes. 
he conceals and reveals according to the good pleasure of his own will. Luke 8, 8b through 10. As he said these things, he would call out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. John sixteen twelve and 13 I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. In this section called, A Sign of Apostasy is Not a Sign, we've seen that the concept of religious defection or apostasy is a sign has no place in Second Thessalonians 2. The error introduced by those entrusted to provide reliable interpretations of the biblical text have fostered the notion that a fall or decline away from the true and genuine faith is a sign that precedes the revealing of the man of lawlessness. This entirely obscures the nature and meaning of the real sign, which is the baptism that reveals. With newfound clarity on the subject, Let's take a moment to reflect on the absurdity of that flawed theological premise. Many view the modern church as having already fallen away from the faith. To one degree or another, it's been seen that way for nearly two millennia. Perhaps the earliest record of such a view can be found in Second Timothy where Paul makes an important observation. 2 Timothy 1.15 You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. In every schism and denominational split that happens within the corporate body of Christ, of which there have been a vast number, one faction always separates itself from another, because they believe that their former associates have become apostate. At what point might the church be considered to be sufficiently apostate for the situation to be identified as the sign Paul warned us about in 2 Thessalonians? Remember, this is going to safeguard us against a lie and assure us that something very central to our hope has not yet happened. Is it realistic to suppose that the assessment of apostasy could serve in that capacity? Consider the event that triggered what's called the Protestant Reformation in 1517. According to legend, the priest Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. With a view to historical significance, a case might well be made that if apostasy could be assigned, his public exposure of the Roman Catholic Church's departure from the apostolic doctrine would surely qualify. Did it? What then? Exercising some critical thinking, either the sign that will eventually appear is defined adequately enough to make it so recognizable that, even in its absence, we can be fully assured in not having witnessed it yet. Or... Paul's entreaty is feeble, pointless, and absurd. A sign where the apostasy of the church has to be gauged can be no sign at all. The sign Paul warned us about is the baptism that reveals, where the spiritual anointing manifests deceptively in the natural realm and is witnessed by the global community. Like how a car is wrecked because of an accident, the lawless one is revealed because the spirit of Antichrist departs from heaven, standing away from his former abode and those who had been charged with his restraint. The coming baptism that reveals is the sign that will be confidently recognized, which will safeguard a small company of informed, alert, and watchful saints. Then will come the day of the Lord, 
that is equated with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him. 2 Thessalonians 2.3 Greek-English Interlinear Not until shall have come, Elthe, the standing away from, apostasia, first, and shall have been revealed, apocalypte, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction. Addenda on the sign. With that matter sorted out, let's visit some other passages of Scripture that offer some relevant insight. The anti-dove unholy spirit of Antichrist is presently abiding in a heavenly place, like an underworld realm, as described in the following passage. Ephesians 6, verses 12 and 13. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. And in Greek, in the day the evil is ente hemera te ponera. If the expression in verse 13 is taken literally, when will the day of evil ever be more immediately manifest than on the appointed day when the man of lawlessness receives the Antichrist anointing? Let's consider 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 6 and 7 together with two verses from the epistle of 1 John. These complementary texts inform us further about how things will change with regard to the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 6 and 7 And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And now 1 John 2 verse 18 Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now, many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. First John 4, verse 3 And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. In the latter verse, the phrase, this is the spirit of the Antichrist, is more literally translated as, this is that of the Antichrist. No Greek word for spirit appears in the text, but it seems reasonably derived from the immediate context. This spirit of Antichrist, or pneuma antichristos, is the antithesis or counterpart of the spirit of Christ, which is the pneuma Christos of Romans 8 verse 9 and 1 Peter 1 verse 11. Things will soon enough be changing with regard to the Antichrist. As I write, things remain as they have been, but when the appointed time arrives, there will be an arrival with a manifest presence. The mystery of lawlessness that pertains to the Antichrist is already at work, which informs us that there is even now a degree of presence and manifestation in the natural realm, as it is already in the world. There have been many Antichrists, among them such as Horus, Apollo, Nimrod, Antiochus, Epiphanes, Nero, Hitler. And it appears to many of us that the spirit of Antichrist has a rapidly rising influence in the world as we approach the day appointed for its ultimate embodiment. Who is the restrainer? Second Thessalonians 2.6 And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time, Cairo, he will be revealed. Many are curious about the identity of the restraining agency. The timely release from restraint will accord with what we read in John 13, where Jesus himself gives the signal. John 13, 24 through 27. So Simon Peter gestured to him and said to him, Tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus then answered, That is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. 
So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. At the scene of what's commonly referred to as the Last Supper, Jesus performed a baptism, dipping, which is the Greek word bapto, the bread, as the false bread from heaven. He then handed it to Judas as a sign to reveal him as the one who would betray him. This seems familiar and relevant, yes? This passage will be addressed more fully as a rich prophetic modeling in part two of this lengthy study about the sign for the bride. Jesus dipped and handed the baptized morsel to Judas, at which point Satan then entered into him. That's the Antichrist anointing, initiated by Jesus. At the time appointed, on his signal, the angel or angels appointed for restraining will cease to do so, which will immediately result in the anointing and revealing. I believe that the willing host modeled by Judas Iscariot will have been genetically groomed in accordance with a particular heritage. At the appointed time, Jesus will give the signal, and at the cessation of the restraining, this prepared vessel will come to embrace the anointing of Pneuma Antichristos. He'll be something of an avatar and the fullest manifestation of the ancient dragon's power and presence. Paul made a declaration in his first letter to the Thessalonians that relates to verse 6 above. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 1 and 2. Now as to the times, chronon, and the epics, chiron, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Paul wrote, As to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. In Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, he wrote that they knew what restrains him, who was appointed to be released in his time. Paul had informed those brethren about things that needed to be referenced, but yet without being repeated in his letter. The omission isn't due to any neglect on Paul's part, which we can be assured of because, as evidenced by the complex linguistic structure of the writ, the letter was entirely scripted by the Holy Spirit. The way the second letter is written informs us that whether or not we ourselves know what restrains him now, it's more important to realize that there is a season for his restraining and a fit moment appointed for his release. The timing is crucial. Today, many saints presume that they are equally well informed or, at the least, adequately informed in matters of timing. Yet, the vast majority are either under-informed or worse, misinformed. Again, the Lord conceals and reveals. He protects His valuables and only entrusts them to those whom He Himself qualifies to serve his own purposes. From what you've read so far in When Cometh That Thief in the Night, that truth should be more and more well established in your mind. Because the knowledge of timing is an essential when it comes to safeguarding the saints against the deception surrounding the lie and the revealing, we give this special attention in part two of this study. However, you're not yet ready for that because more of the foundation remains to be laid.